Now, before we even start this video, the best advice I can give you to start consulting better with kids is to actually have kids. Getting a sense of what is normal at different age groups as you watch your kids grow is super, super useful. And then finally, when it comes down to the examination, knowing how to handle a baby or to handle a kid becomes much easier when you've already done that with your own children. And you're not worried about actually breaking the child that you're examining. And so if you've always been on the fence about whether to have kids or not, well, feel free to pause this video and um, come back when you're ready. The three tips that I wanna concentrate on in this video is, is number one, a resource tip, number two, is a clinical system tip and number three is a communication tip and I have created a video called the seven internet tabs that you open as a GP and within that is a completely free resource that I will often use when I am consulting with pediatric patients and that is the Royal Children's Hospital. Now I'm currently working in Australia and even when I was working in the UK we were still using these guidelines because they are really well written. Now just bear in mind that some of these guidelines will drift into the remit of secondary care. Some of these recommendations are a little bit more advanced so just bear that in mind. Now this is the website you go down to health professionals and you basically just click on clinical practice guidelines. Now, I'll be honest, the search function isn't so great, so you will have to choose the guidelines that you are interested in. And as far as I'm concerned, one of the guidelines that I use really, really often is the constipation guidelines. And why I find this really useful is that constipation is just such a common presented complaint. There will typically be three times where kids go through a constipation phase that is not pathological, that is not sinister in any way. The first phase that I've noticed is weaning, the second phase is potty training, and the third phase is when they go into some kind of schooling system and they're either scared or disgusted of the toilets. And let's be honest, we've all been there so no judgment here. Why I find this is really important is because it has the disimpaction management. Now sometimes if kids are constipated or there's overflow and one of my patients actually called it paradoxical constipation. I don't know if that's a thing but uh, it does make perfect sense. You need to be very clear and instruct parent on how to give these laxatives and what I will often do is I will basically just highlight this whole bit and just copy and paste it into a word document and print it out for them. So what this basically means is the child is getting the right amount of sachets on the right days and is getting the amount amount that is appropriate to their age. I will often see kids that are a little bit older and they're basically using tiny doses of pediatric Movicol, for instance, and it's kind of quote unquote not working. So this is great to help with that. And I find these guidelines are also great when we're talking about penis conditions. Uh, we used to use these guidelines in the UK, the penis and the foreskin. This is absolutely brilliant. And it will cover all of the major things that you are thinking about here, especially when we're talking about phimosis, paraphimosis, uh, zipper injuries. This definitely isn't something that I'm going to be managing in GP, at least at this stage of my career. Uh, but yeah, here we go. So you'll pretty much be wanting to use wire cutters here. Oh, there's actually a little picture. I'll probably blur that one out for you. Now, another guideline that I will often look at is the molluscum guideline, such a common condition in kids. And for GPs, it's really easy to diagnose and it's really easy to give advice about treatment, which is pretty much don't do anything. It'll go away without any scarring. But that can be a little bit tricky when the lesions are a little bit more widespread. There are a few pictures here of what this looks like. And there's some advice here about management. But what you can basically do is turn the screen and you can go through the guidelines with the parent and just kind of explain that most children actually do not require any treatment. And there's no exclusion from daycare or school that is required. Now, the other two guidelines that I will often use are health pathways, and I have spoken about this before. I make sure to choose the health pathways that is relevant to the state that you are in. And then I will also use the therapeutic guidelines. Unfortunately, that is one that you have to pay for. Now, tip number two pertains to the clinical system that a lot of GPs use in Australia called best practice. But I will show you two little tips that are absolutely life-changing. <laughs> Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, probably not life-changing, but super, super useful and time-saving. Now, the first one that I find really useful is to know where these centile charts are. Now, often kids will come in with coughs and colds, and this is especially relevant if children are attending some kind of childcare setting like nursery or pre kindy They're going through what we call nursery school syndrome, which means that they essentially have to build up their immunity. Now, one thing that reassures us as clinicians is that now, even though these kids are having coughs and colds that aren't really going away, if their weight is continuing to track along the centile charts, that is reassuring for us. That means that there's unlikely to be anything pathological going on, and they are just going through that normal process. And where you can find the centile charts is up here in clinical, and go down to percentile charts. Now what's really important here is that you are coding the weight every time you see a patient. And if you want to know more about how to code examination findings, I have created a video that goes through the basics of best practice and I'll include it in the link below. But basically what you can see is if you click on weight, every time that child comes in and we record the weight and we code it, the centile charts will automatically suck in that information and basically plot that on the chart. Now by and large, your red flags are if the child's weight starts dropping more than two centiles. So as you can see, this child started along the green centile, the child did lose a little bit of weight, but
but seems to be by and large tracking okay. So at this point, that can give us a little bit of reassurance. Now, the second thing I wanna show you is super, super interesting, and I haven't encountered this in other clinical systems. When you want to do a prescription, you go into the current prescriptions and you click on add. And say you want to prescribe some amoxicillin for otitis media for whatever reason, you will choose the syrup preparation, double click, and then right here you have something called dose calculator, and this is absolutely brilliant. When you click on dose calculator, and providing you have seen that patient and documented the weight, it will automatically suck that into the dose calculator. Let's say this child is 12 kilograms. So at this point, you want to pop in the dose. Now, if you want to know what the dose is for otitis media, well, you can use any of those guidelines that I spoke about. This is the RCH guidelines for otitis media, and it says here 30 milligrams per kg per dose twice daily for five days. So what I will do is I will go back into the dose calculator. I will write 30 milligrams per kg per dose. This child needs two doses per day. And the strength here is the prescription that you chose. So I chose the 250 milligrams per five mil. So I will write here 250 milligrams per five mil. And once you've done that, if you click calculate, it will do the calculation for you. What you can do is click on insert. And as you can see, it is automatically plopped it in here. <laughs> so for me, this was such a life changer. Obviously, I'm getting a little bit too excited about this. But if you haven't used dose calculator before for your pediatric patients, absolute time saver. Now, the last tip I want to share with you is a communication skills tip. And this might not be relevant if you're a bit more advanced in your career and you're very comfortable dealing with pediatric patients. But if you are a medical student or a young GP and you're just starting out and you're in a situation where your pediatric consultations will often end in kids screaming and trying to kick you as you're examining their throat, then this might be actually pretty useful for you. The difficult thing with this consultation technique is that you need to get over yourself. If you use this, it will make you feel super self-conscious, but I guarantee that 90% of your consultations after using this technique generally go okay. There will always be that consultation where it just doesn't work out, where the child is just screaming down the room, where there's nothing that you can do about that. You just do your limited assessment. So how this basically works is that the parent and the child come in and they sit down. I will fully concentrate on the parent and let them essentially exhaust their history. At this stage, the parent can take the child, pop it onto their lap. And then what I will do is I will actually bend down, look directly at the child and address the child directly. And I will even do this if the child is nonverbal. What I mean by that is that they're really, really young. And I will basically address them by their first name and say, right, Patty, so your mommy is telling me that you've had a bit of a sore throat. I'm sorry to hear about that. Is it okay if we check you over? And I'll basically nod for them and then they will start nodding. And then every time I'm doing a part of the examination, I'm speaking to the child directly and I will often do the examination bit on myself first. So I'll take the thermometer, put it into my ear, make it make that beepy noise and then see, well, let's see if you can hear that beepy noise. Same thing when I'm auscultating a child, I will auscultate myself first, auscultate them, auscultate myself, auscultate them. When I'm doing an ear examination, I will literally put the otoscope into my ear and I'll bring my ear up to the child so that they can have a look into my ear. And I find that that works really, really well. And so essentially, if you do give it a try, again, at first, it is a little bit embarrassing. If you are directly addressing nonverbal children, you will get some dodgy stares from the parents. But once the examination goes really well, it's often very satisfying to hear a comment along the lines of, oh, Patty, you're so well behaved today with the doctor. So I hope those three tips make sense. So just to recap here, the three tips are number one, a resource tip, and that is the Royal Children's Hospital. Number two is a clinical systems tip, and that is the sent out charts and how to use the dose calculator, which is absolutely tremendous. And number three is a communication skills tip. So addressing the child directly, even if they are nonverbal. I hope that was useful and good luck.